in Southeast Asia. I think uh, Hera is an important uh, community, I mean, higher education community, with these new um, you know, countries or research into this region will enrich the whole community here. So, okay, Amelia, now is your time. Thank you. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. So I'm, I'm delighted to present to all of you the, the research that we have embarked on. Uh, it's a team of us, a team of uh, all PhD students from different universities. Uh, we have been collaborating to, um, to produce uh, a very interesting paper, in my opinion. And we're very excited to show the preliminary results. Um, so we're, we're looking at basically scientific productivity. Originally, the idea started with uh, looking at five ASEAN countries. And uh, we had shared some preliminary results before, but then we were very interested in Indonesia, particularly because of uh, what is happening uh, within their higher education system. So uh, before I proceed, I just want to acknowledge the other PhD students, which I am, they, were, they gave me the honor to represent them. So, you know, uh, we have also two Indonesian students from Taipei Tech, Junedi and Stephanus, and then two from Perspective, or two students that will soon go to Luxembourg University, who were Bea and Juan Jose. So, um, without further ado, then I'll, I'll proceed to the, to the content. So, what, uh, what I want to share, if you can see in this graph, is just a prelim that what we had uh, known before from the five ASEAN countries, including Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, and the Philippines. And if we look at this graph that I borrowed from uh, Mago Jr., Indonesia's higher education productivity has been quite high, and it has exponentially increased since 2012, 13, 14, then in 2017, it just skyrocketed. Uh, and these are not necessarily the, uh, the ones that are indexed, but just the overall productivity. So we were looking at what, what is exactly happening in Indonesia that they're just producing and producing, and it's an exponential growth, right? In fact, when you look at the at the at the data that we had gathered, comparing the the scientific production over the years and against uh, international collaboration, um, Indonesia's uh, data is quite interesting. In in fact, it has turned into a U uh, into a U shaped curve. So what is this showing is that while there are countries like, I would say, I cannot see, uh, okay, like Malaysia that are improving in their international productivity, Malaysia, uh, Malaysia's international, uh, sorry, Indonesia's international collaboration is just taking a turn down, yet their scientific productivity is just growing exponentially. If you can see, that's the first graph. And then of course, there are the others that are very modest in terms of their productivity, Vietnam, Philippines. So we took a very keen interest in Indonesia. So that's where our focus is going uh, mostly. Uh, when we look at the, the background, right, first we understand that academic publication is an indicator, a very good indicator of individual and institutional performance. And a lot of higher education systems use productivity by scholars as a means of uh, promotional or financial incentives. And this has happened for decades, right? If you produce, you get more research grants. If you produce, you, 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 you are promoted to higher status. But uh, when you look at Indonesia's total index publications, it still falls behind uh, the countries like Singapore, Malaysia, and Thailand. Despite that they have been producing, they're still not that high as they would be hoping. Uh, when you look at funding for national research, Indonesia's funding is one of the lowest in the region at 0.2% of their GDP in comparison to 3.2 uh, in Singapore or 1.2 um, in Malaysia. So what we can understand from here is that maybe the incentives for, for publications in, Malay in Indonesia might not be necessarily financial because there is not a lot of uh, resources provided for, for, fun for research. But maybe it might be for some kind of promotional incentives. Why are, are, are why is Indonesia producing a lot of uh, papers, a lot of publications, and what is happening around the 2012-2014 period that is really driving this whole exponential growth in productivity? So we took uh, some uh, time to explore the different um, the different kind of policies that happen, and you know, with the advent of performance accountability, driving world class universities, and what are the performance based systems that are or the performance based regulations that have been passed that have encouraged publications from uh, 
from um, academics, and we found several uh, around the time of 2014, 2000 and 2012 to 2014. And the first one was the 2010 strategic plan by the Indonesian GGHE, which is the first time that they really integrated within their plan, the achieving a world-class uh, status universities. In fact, what they did is that they selected a group of universities and they said, okay, we need you to get into the higher education rankings. Now, I can share with you that even though there has been a high amount of publications out by Indonesia, only three universities are actually in the Q, uh, QS rankings up to now. So that means that even though there is production, even though the quest for world class is there, it has not been as successful as before. Around the same time in 2013, a, uh, a different ministry, because Indonesia appears to have a very complex uh, law system, a complex system of who governs what, so there is like a lot of um, policies from one, gover uh, from one government entity and another policy. As you can see, the second regulation in 2013 was that, okay, uh, lecturers and uh, academics, I should say, would have different functions and different credits that would be attached to them. And if they publish, then they will be uh, uh, getting some amount of credit which can earn them a promotion. So then this is based around the same time that they're saying, okay, we need to achieve a world-class status. And the, one of the ways that they can achieve is by productivity, right? So then we uh, we can recall these two um, these two uh, policies, but they're not very direct and saying, you know what, you need to for you need to force them. We don't have money to incentivize you. So how can we make sure that you produce? So regulation number 94 of 2014 was a very key one. 2014, a very key year when the productivity just skyrocketed. If you can see my, my notes here, there were the uh, productivity was compulsory. It was no longer required, it was no longer said that you know what. You have the option. No, you need to. You must produce. But the but the requirements were a little bit different for the for the ranks of the different persons. For instructors and assistant professors, they were required to produce in national journals, right? And for associate professors, again, in national yet accredited journals. But these first two, we must uh, we must understand that they are not necessarily indexed by Scopus. Why do I bring Scopus? Because Scopus only indexes international rec internationally recognized journals, which would mean that only professors in this case would be falling under the, the, the policy, uh, under, under the data that we are analyzing. So we try to figure out what exactly is happening that is pushing the, the productivity uh, that would end up in Scopus. And this is when there was a very important policy in 2017 which says that if you really want to get a promotion in 2017, you have two options. One is to publish three papers in nationally indexed journals, or one in an internationally indexed journal. Now, what is easier, three or one, right? So we, 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 we're, we're assuming and making an assumption that, well, it's easier to publish one, and if you publish one, you get higher credits. And if you get higher credits, you get a promotion quite faster. So you can move from being an instructor to an assistant professor to an associate professor with one or two publications. So Indonesia is really not using, it appears that their policies are not pushing into incentives, uh, uh, financial incentives, but more like promotional incentives according to their own um, uh, policies. So we're making an assumption that there were these policies there that are driving the quest for world class status. And a lot of the, 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 the academics here are trying to push for at least one or two publications in internationally um, accredited journals that would be in the Scopus. So what exactly did we find? If you look at the first research question that, that I have posted here, now uh, we have uh, three research questions that I didn't necessarily mention, but I will be just uh, at the same time discussing it along with the results. And the first one is the institutional competition and the scientific collaboration. Well, the first, the first thing that we understood is that, uh, uh, if you remember, there were a number of universities that were selected to determine this uh, or to, to drive this world-class quest. And this is what we labeled as the flagship universities. And as we can see here, um, the flagship universities are not necessarily producing as much as the non-flagship universities. In fact, from 2012 to 2014, which is around the period of the, the of the, the policy, that is when I get uh, you know uh, at that point they were very uh, they were parallel. They were producing amount of, about the same um, number of publications, but then eventually the whole 
policy from 2017. It appears that they already had some ideas in 2017 that they that, that you know that the 2017 policy was coming, and they were saying in the previous three years, if you have at least one, you can have a, a, a promotion. So it appears that a lot of universities were were interested, or a lot of academics, I should say, were interested in this policy, so that it might have driven this whole publication. Um, uh, uh, publication praise, I would say, because they were all just publishing and publishing, but the policy didn't really target the flagship universities, which were supposed to be driving the whole world-class quest. So this is very interesting because we're seeing that the non-flagship universities are really driving the productivity in Indonesia. Now, we're also looking at the collaboration patterns. Now, we understood that the international collaboration from the first graph that I shared was actually decreasing. So how are they really collaborating? I mean, how are they really producing their research? So this is where we have another graph here, which is called the Sankey diagram. And they, they have been divided in two different, um, in two different uh, uh, groups of universities, the flagship universities and the non-flagship universities. Now, I must share that the non-flagship university is accountable for about 55% of the total research productivity. And if you look now to the uh, flagship universities, let's just concentrate there. The majority, can you see my my pointer? Okay. The majority of the, of the flagship universities prefer to be single authors. This is about 50% of them prefer to be single authors. And from the about 50% of their publications as single authors, the majority are Q3. For those of us who are familiar with the index focus, Q3 is not the best. We prefer Q1 or Q2. But from Q3 down is actually the, what, what people call the mediocre, uh, the mediocre uh, uh, um, uh, journals, right? So therefore, this accounts for a, for a great proportion of the, the, the number of publications. So, if you look now, also quite interesting in terms of the Q5. Now, I will share an interesting story. In, Scopus only has Q1 to Q4. So any journal that is international, in, uh, but not necessarily falling under any category, we just classified it under Q5. So we can see that there is also a relatively large amount of publications that have no quality index. So it's about, uh, it's about what, about, I would say almost as the same as the Q3. So that means that the number of publications that fall in Q1 are almost the same as the number of publications that have no quality index in Scopus. So that means that the number of publications here are being, uh, the, the productivity in Indonesia by the flagship universities might necessarily be of low quality, but still index in Scopus and still being recognized to drive the productivity. But we would say with not so high quality. Um, and a similar situation will be found by the non-flagship universities. If you notice uh, the great majority, about 55% again of the publications are single authors, and the majority are from Q3 and Q5, most specifically from Q5. So the low quality in publications, even though the quantity is high, there is a, a very consistent low quality number of publications that is driving Indonesia's exponential growth in scientific productivity. Quite interesting, I would say. Um, now, we also looked at the research production, the individual research production, but we also looked at the number of new scholars that were bringing, brought into Indonesian higher education system, because around the same time of 2012, there was this higher education act that I did not refer to at the beginning, but the higher education act in Indonesia was saying that there must be at least a community college in every community or every island to, uh, to enhance access to higher education by um, Indonesian students. And as we can see here, from the, uh, 2010, 2012, the number of new scholars added has remained consistently at about 60%. So what can we understand from this? Every year, there is a, a, about 60% new scholars added to the higher education system. And these scholars, if they really want to get a promotion, they must publish. Otherwise, they will stay. So maybe we, we, we can make an assumption here that these new scholars are also just publishing. They want one internationally uh, accepted journal, which would be enough to earn credits for a promotion. It doesn't matter what the quality is. It doesn't matter if it falls in Q1 or Q3. They just want one. And it might be that these are the ones that are driving. In fact, if you can see the, 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 the graph above, the number of new scholars which would be the, the gray one, or it's almost, uh, almost the same, and at the end of uh, 2020, even more than the 
old scholars in the system. I mean, I w I'm not saying old by age, but you know, the ones that have been there for quite a long time. So it's quite interesting. Uh, in fact, if you look at the at the publication preference by the two scholars, you know, the new scholars after 2014 and the, the scholars that have been there, it actually shows that the new scholars, the blue line, are actually driving the growth of the majority target Q5 journals, which have no ranking on Scopus. So we can see that the preference is more like um, for just getting accepted in an internationally uh, index journal, not necessarily of good quality, but just get accepted, right? And then we also did a very last uh, analysis and just a very quick um, uh, summary of the publication preference by the different generations. We did before the policy around 2008 to 2010, during the policy time between 2011 and 2013, and after. And if you can see again, we can show you what happened. So there was a group of people that were there before Group 1, a group of people that came in uh, around the policy, and the group of people that came in after. And if we can see the graphs here, the publication history by group, I will just highlight a very interesting uh, scenario. For the Q1, before the policy, right? For the Q1, for the uh, Q1 journals, uh, the Group 1 was driving it. That was the one that uh, was you know they were they were targeting that that was the group one targeting it and then the the new uh, the new ones were not necessarily there but if you look at Q5 it's a completely inverted graph so what this is showing to you is that again there is a quest for world class status and if i if you allow me to share my temperate conclusions we understand that indonesian academics are pressured to publish within a scientific bubble why do we say bubble because then the collaboration is just with themselves, single authorships or collaboration within them with, with themselves and you know with uh, people that they know within their own scientific community, but not necessarily internationally, international collaboration. Again, we we are very um, I think we should be very careful to share that there has been an definitely been an increased publications, but with mediocre results. Uh, it's a very strong word I would say, but it's the truth. And it appears that Indonesia is quite uh, concerned about quantity at the moment for world-class status over than the quality. So uh, these are just preliminary. We still need uh, to do more analysis. We still need to dig into more of the data to quite understand a little bit more about it. But this is basically what I have to share with you all. Thank you for listening. OK, okay thank you. For I hope our Indonesian colleague will not be I'm happy with you, particularly about the comment and the, the findings. I, I believe, yeah, the quantity over the quality could be a you know a lasting issue. Not just only probably not just only for Indonesia. I guess in Taiwan or some you know East Asia, it, it continues to be a, a hard issue for you know those people who are looking into the quality of our higher education research. And all, you know, the policy maker focus on the Q1 journal or, you know, a leading journal. And, but we all understand that that was not easy and probably take time as well. But your finding is quite interesting. So now I think we are happy to open to the public, open to the floor. And then any of you want to ask a question? Okay. It's uh, Angia, is it? Please. Yeah, that's Angia. Thank you. Angia. Okay. Yes. <laughs> thank Angia. you. And thank you for the presentations. And it's such a um, uh, coincidence, maybe, because I come from Indonesia. <laughs> yeah. So and I'm currently, yeah, yeah. And I'm currently uh, studying in Seoul National University. I'm a uh, PhD candidate uh, in higher education. So I would like to, uh, because actually my topic of dissertation is really related to this topic that you take. So no, I'm not offended at all by the results <laughs> because actually that's what uh, the policymakers and all the um, Indonesian academics are actually worried about. So uh, if you say that the, the incentive is only a matter of like to gain a, like promotion, actually it's uh, more than that. So if you see like in the 
flagship universities, they have this um, policy of incorporation where uh, the government is kind of like pushing the universities to become autonomous. So uh, at first they chose and selected several universities to become the you know leading autonomous universities and then the rest would follow. So if you want to apply to become autonomous, then there are like some processes. And actually, uh, as a, from the perspective as a junior academics, uh, I can see the huge uh, differences uh, before 2014, particularly and after 2014, because before that, um, you know, uh, if you get some grant which is not too big and then you have just to make a report and of course, uh, if you want to publish it in a journal or a book, it's good. But then the policy change, as you mentioned, because of that, but actually there is a, a huge amount of incentives that we get. So I, I might say maybe for a university which has a bigger um, funding, uh, they can arrange their own incentive uh, policy for their academics. In my case, my university is also in one flagship uh, university. Uh, but in, for, okay, let's say for example, uh, the evaluations is every six months. Let's say I just uh, am required to fulfill the three credits minimum for research. So our basic, um, our basic, uh, what is it like uh, the requirements is 12 credits. And then as a junior academics, you have to fulfill at least one research credits. But then if you fill three, then it's better, right? And aside of that, if you publish more in a higher journal, you get a quiet amount of Particularly, I think it's a quite good incentive, but then it requ uh, it also becomes another issue because if you come from a STEM uh, major, so you publish easier and more, and it was quite a you know problematic issues as well. Because when I compare, let's say, with my other colleagues, I was like so surprised of like the amount. Thank you. Of <laughs> do, you do you want to ask questions uh, to yes. to Amelia? Yeah, please. Yeah. Oh, no, okay, no, but I just uh, give the comment. So I think that okay, it is more than okay. uh, the incentive is actually there are like uh, financial incentives. So uh, maybe in the future research, what you would like to see is to see like uh, the amount of the research and development spending. Right now, mm -hmm. the government is trying to do a new policy uh approach which the new establish uh, policy on national system of science and technology so i mean like the, the idea of uh, only pushing on the certain publications is not actually 100 percent true because we require specific uh, uh minimum like if you go to q3 or q2 that's when you can uh, get into a higher position let's say associate profession uh, professors this kind of thing so i think it would be very important maybe to see it in the future research uh why it happens and maybe the the reason why the number of non-flagship universities publish more is actually because of the total number of universities because the rest of the <laughs> number of public universities is so high that's why maybe uh, the number is also very high and it's a very good research as well thank you thank you for uh, actually yeah thank you for your comment I, I i think it's it's valuable because one of the limitations that we were having is trying to find the uh trying to find the information in english especially because the, the, it comes around from the same we, we understood it from the same thing if we cannot find publications that are indexed Mm -hmm. it opus, then it's difficult for us to understand the policy uh, or especially because most of the publications be national. So one of the limitations that I, I think and I, I appreciate your comment is that uh, we needed to have an expert from Indonesia. So that's why we mm -hmm. have two mm -hmm. Indonesian students there that need to translate for us a lot of the policies to understand. And, and so, so therefore, maybe we don't know the full story because we still need to dig in and find more uh, uh, documents written in Bahasa to really get the point. Mm. So I really appreciate mm. your comment. Thank you. Thank okay, you. thank you, Amelia. Probably you also can consider do a little bit interview to dig in the, the rationale or motivation for uh, those uh, flagship and non flagship thing, and maybe you have some new finding. Okay, so other questions. I think we we need to invite more you know participants to engage with the research. That would be the main purpose for a panel, isn't it? So, is anyone want to ask question? Any comments, feedbacks? Uh, okay, we we, we have. So, so yeah. do, do you yeah. mind yeah. if I? <laughs> yes, yes, okay. Yes. Uh, Okay, I mean, it's a very interesting issue. I have the two questions for your research. One is about, have you, your team have 
has your team ever thought of to take the numbers of the citations into the considerations when you talk about you know, just the numbers of the papers? Mm. So now you see uh, several global rankings. Uh, they won't just focus on the numbers of the papers published. They will really see or even edge index, etc. I mean, that would be more. I mean, in certain way, though, you you, you think that the quality is the issue, but. I, I, I'm thinking it's probably you need more evidence to support this one, like citation, national journals. And then, I know it's more complicated because the national uh, uh, journals probably that the index system is not okay, well established. But, but this is my citation speech. And another one is, seems you talk about that is the compulsory uh, policies for the professors or even so all, uh, you know, the state. Uh, uh, you know, uh, professors. But, but I, I'm thinking, how, how about a feel? You know, the Taiwan is also always, we have this kind of argument, always argue, okay, for some humanity arts. How about those professors? Are, are they, um, because you think, you, you're talking about that the professor are supposed to publish in the international journals. Mm -hmm. So how about all the fields from humanity arts or even some local, okay, uh, you know, programs, whatever, that this is one thing. How, how exactly it responds to that? And this means that it will try to publish in a very, very low quality of journals, open access, and then or preparatory journals in order to, you know, to complete that mission. So uh, this is my, my second question. And my third, could I have one more? <laughs> because you're talking about the international <laughs> cooperation pattern. But uh, I think you rarely talk about this. I, I'm interested to know if they have some some uh, findings, like the Q1, maybe the professors will have more cooperations with the Western scholars, were, and then the Q5, Q3, maybe, okay, just local or Asian. I don't know. That, that would be I'm mean, interested to know. Okay. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Are you, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. You know uh, from, from, from your questions, I think we can write two or three articles. <laughs> But to, to, to answer the first question, um, I, I, I have the privilege to work with an amazing team and they are good at data. So I'm pretty sure that the, the data for citation indexes uh, can be got, gotten. But how well can we integrate it within the story? Uh, within the story, I'm not sure how, how, how we would work around it. Of course, I'm pretty sure it's, it's doable. So uh, I probably would need to bring that to the team that they, you know, because it's Scopus, Scopus has access to a lot of this data citation indexes. So I think we can do that. Um, probably for another paper, right? So, <laughs> but I, because I, I think your, your questions are like to address all of them within one article might be a very, uh, a very ambitious task. <laughs> so, but yes, I, I think the data is available and it's worthy to explore in terms of quality. Which journals, I would, if I understand you, which journals have been cited and what are the citation indexes for, for each of the publications and so on so that we can produce and uh, have a quality indicator also. So that in my conclusion, if I say quantity over quality, I also have that, that uh, data to, to prove that yes, there is indeed a, a preference for quantity than quality. So maybe that one we could probably integrate. Um, in terms of uh, discipline, you, you said by, by field, STEM or humanities or so. Um, I think also Scopus data is also divided into such disciplines, but I'm not sure if that one can be integrated within this paper. I can see the citation index being integrated, but I'm not sure about the STEM. Probably, uh, the, like I said, the data is available, probably, but then it could be part of an exploration in terms for another another uh, paper. Can you remind me of the third question? I forgot about that one. Yeah, but I see you missed one question uh, because Angela suggests whether can you have national uh, index about the local uh, domestic publication. <laughs> because we use Scopus data, the national yeah. index uh, uh, um, journals are not necessarily uh, accessible through Scopus. So that was one mm. of the limitations that we only focus on internationally recognized journals that are indexed in Scopus. So the national ones, that means the publications uh, from the lecturers or the associate professors may not necessarily be uh, represented within what we're doing. And mm. so it, what could be is that because of, because of the, the 2017 policies, most of them are actually targeting the international mm. journal, which is easier to earn the credits needed for the research. Because, uh, I mean, if I expand on the Indonesian policy, they have three ways to earn credits. One is teaching, one is community service, and one is research. So they call mm. it, I, uh, I forgot the name, in Bahasa, but that is a three-part component. So I'm, I'm assuming that it's easier for them to do the international 
uh, journal publication to get the credit. So uh, that's where we're saying that, you know, probably we're, that's what, we didn't do an analysis based on who published what, if it's a lecturer or an associate professor. Mm -hmm. I don't think we can have access to the data via Scopus, but uh, we are assuming that most of the publications come from the, uh, from the pool of the, the people that are required to publish within the time, but not necessarily from the national, national accepted journals, yeah. Okay, thank you, Amelia. Other question uh, to our two presenters? About I think the other question. Sorry, yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, my other question is about the international uh, cooperation pattern. Oh, mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. pattern. Okay, can you remind me again? I, 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 I international think. cooperation. Uh, 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 the Indonesia scholar, how exactly they cooperate with uh, the Q1 to Q5, maybe uh, they, they were talking on the different uh, scholars or different countries. Okay, the Q1 to Q5, the international collaboration. I think our our, our uh, data somehow shows that. Let me share that screen with you. Uh, I think this diagram here, the one that you can see uh, here, is actually. Can you see my screen? No. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good. Slide. Okay, so uh, I, as you can see, the, the 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 collaboration patterns for the you're saying from foreign, right? So you can see that the foreign collaboration pattern uh, in terms of they, like in this case they would go to Q1. Uh, so the, the gray one is the collaboration with foreign uh, organizations. So they would generally go to Q1 if you see collaboration um, with with the flagship universities. The majority would go to Q1, and a smaller portion would go to Q3 or and so on. So the Sankey diagram kind of addresses that the question that you, you had to, 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 a, to an extent. And within non-flagship universities, again, the foreign, uh, again, they go to Q1. So we can see that the collaboration really leads to a little bit of increased quality with international collaboration, right? So we can kind of address that uh, within this uh, this diagram here. I don't know if I answered your question. Maybe we might need to dig a little bit more. Yeah. Uh... I think this is an issue, yeah, because it tend to be uh, a young generation. I mean, junior, they have more opportunity to collaborate with international scholars, which leading to higher, you know, good quality uh, journal publication. So I think it's the the difference is the, the generation happening actually. So I think yeah, it is quite interesting. Yeah, I think questions to our presentation. Yeah. I have a question for Tang. Tang. Have you considered that why your government still keep the 39 ministry university and what's the purpose or any you know structural uh, difficulty reforming you know uh, entirely at the same time or they just want to uh, make as a comparison group? I, I mean, there's a nine ministry you know university and all MOE university and look at how their performance uh, respectfully. What, what would you think? <laughs> yes, yes, thank you very much for your question. Uh, well, uh, actually, uh, it's a part uh, because the, the reason we uh, did the task for the live ministry to manage the higher education because, like, because they will provide their own workforce in the field. But currently, it seems like it's not suitable to the uh, current situation. Mm -hmm. But the reason, uh, also, the government want to eliminate their control. But mm -hmm. because in Vietnam, the power of liability is very strong. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, uh, even like uh, very difficult to like to 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 ask them to uh, to give up their <laughs> their university or their their. their the academy. Mm -hmm. So, because, because there, yeah, the, I think the main reason is because sometimes their power mm -hmm. is also very strong. And the main reason, from my understanding, is uh, because eight years the government distribute so uh, financial resources for mm -hmm. this ministry. Mm -hmm. So if they keep their, if they they they, they, they have their uh, their uh, university, so they will receive some financial resource. Mm -hmm. And they also have some power in terms of changing a point, uh, a point, some like academic leader, mm -hmm. residence or vice residence, something like that. So I think, yeah, it's, it's some, some reason. Yeah. But, so uh, it's, it sounds like that those nine ministries, they, just don't want, they don't want to give up their university because there's a certain benefit having those, you know, 
Sabonis University, which is could be very useful, even linking to the industry, isn't it? And maybe the future employment opportunity. So it's just not only about the university per se, it's also about the linkage between the higher education system and the employment. So do, do you think that that would be one of the, you know, structural difficulty reforming the current, you know, configuration? Yeah. Yeah, but there's another point of view from the Asian perspective, like, because of the uh, light ministry every year they receive many, uh, they, I, 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 I would say that they receive very good financial research mm. from, from mm. their own ministry. So right. if they, now they will, don't have the support from liability. So mm. this means that they need to uh, decide everything. They need to find the fund or something like that. So mm. it's, it's, it's both sides, they don't want to give up. <laughs> okay. My uh, ministry don't want to give up their uh, institution. Is it uh, leader don't want to give up their, 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 their umbrella? Yeah, the umbrella. I would because say the umbrella. there's more, more money for them, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> So if they right. go to Ministry of Education, because Ministry of Education is uh, two, two, two or two, uh, almost uh, two and uh, uh, two hundred thirty jurisdictions, so they need, they need mm. to balance, they need to distribute. So if now, right. because if uh, only one ministry, mm. okay, so understandable. understandable. Okay, okay, thank you. Yes. Any thank question you. Uh, from our participants to the presentation? Yeah, it's about the time. Yeah, I think we, we have a long section here. But again, I would like to speak to our presenters, uh, you know, for articles, which is uh, very informative, uh, interesting, and also in uh, quite in light, uh, insightful as well. And I think uh, your presentation contributes to the discussion uh, academically and scholarly. And we also, because you are PhD student is your hope, new young generation. We do hope that you can remain at this uh, community, particularly he, uh, HERA. So now you understand the mission of the HERA. So I strongly urge you to remain here annually and continue to come back, contribute to the society, and that, that would be our best wish. I think definitely Professor Angel Ho, why she want to pay so much attention to you. That, that is the, you know, nurturing young generation. So hopefully you will enjoy it and we looking for your, you know, achievement later. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you everyone. Angela, thank you. Thank you, thank you. So wonderful, <laughs> And so the next section, I think uh, also very valuable and useful for all of you mm. because uh, Professor Hata and Jistam uh, that will share you um, mm. great experiences uh, in uh, research publication mm. and they both actually uh, mm. ever serve as uh, editors in not just the books, journals, special mm. issues. So I think mm -hmm. they're very useful sections for all of you. So yeah, yeah. yeah. you're yeah. welcome to participate in it. Yeah. 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 Okay. okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, bye bye. So, thank you. See you. See you. Thank bye bye. You. bye, -bye.